Round two, Portimao, Portugal. It's time to wrap up everything we saw over the weekend of MotoGP, Moto2 and Moto3 action for you. As always with our post race weekend videos you can find everything i'm talking about time chaptered below skip to whatever you want we're going to be talking about everything the mark and peco stuff and all that stuff that'll be down there and of course always remember hit like if you want to show your appreciation moto gp i thought it was good this weekend very good poor hey martin let's start there standout performer was excellent on sunday saturday didn't quite have the pace i mean he really swapped roles with peco this week didn't he the two of them just completely just opposite of their usual form uh, i mean we always when you see someone do this you always the first thing that comes to your head is like you always have to talk about the the lorenzo style of win metronomic dropping the hammer consistently lap by lap just quicker and quicker and he just kept going martin they couldn't catch him and the two guys behind him vinales and bastianini were both excellent as well i thought but they just every time they dropped the hammer a little bit he dropped it a little bit further and just controlled that distance that gap out front and i think this is where you have to start to look now with peco having the weekend he had and like i said we will talk about him it does make martin a threat in a way that he didn't feel like he was last year he was always there but you never felt like Peko was going to give it up. It just always felt like Peko would have enough in the end. But now it just, it's very like 50-50. This is the most confident I've been with Martin's title push, even with how good he was last season, because he's doing it from the start now. And if we talk about Peko, Peko will give you opportunities. We know this. Even when Peko is dominating, he still gives you chances. And someone who's willing or has the ability to be a bit more consistent than than his challenges have been in the last couple of years. So if Martin can get the consistency going where he's he has one of those seasons like you see the greats have where they're like, you watch back through their results and it's like they finish top three in 90% of the races. They maybe have one DNF and then they finish another couple of races in fourth or fifth. And Peko doesn't do that. So if you're going to be able to go on and do that, if Martin can go on and do stuff like that, or at least be close to that, it really, really makes him the favorite, I think, because Peko will give you chances. He does it. And he did it this weekend. And it's one of those things where you just, you, every year we come back going, yeah, well, Peko's the dominant rider. He's just going to be the best. He's the quickest. And we know he's been inconsistent in the past, but this year he'll surely have figured that out. He never does. So we just always end up in this position. Peko will give you chances and he's giving Martin a chance. Now he's even given Bastianini a chance. And while we're talking about Peko, we may as well talk about the coming together with Mark. I mean, I don't know how everyone saw it. I mean, I kind of at first instinct had it. I mean, it's a racing incident. It's a racing incident. My first instinct, if I had to lay blame, I'm like 60-40 Peko, maybe 55-45 Peko, right? Just because he's the one that's gone into the side of the other guy. But really, it is very much a... You know, I mean, let me know in the comments how you saw it. But yeah, complete racing incident for me. I think it's the right decision by the stewards in the end. But the more interesting point, I think this is the beginnings of this bubbling up of this Rossi Marquez thing. Because this has brought Marquez to the front against these boys while they're at their best. And I'm talking about these boys as in the Academy boys, the Rossi Academy lads. It's the first time where Mark's going to be consistently at the front while these guys are kind of at the front. We look at Pecco, if Bez gets himself up there, and if any of these other lads, Morbidelli at any point, and Digi, because he's kind of in it, he's part of it now, he's riding for the team. If these guys find themselves with Mark on track, like how aggressive is it going to get? Because I just feel like, and I'm not saying like Rossi's sending guys out there, or Uchio is sending guys out there to do this, but I think in their head, they have this loyalty to Rossi. They probably came through the ranks as younger guys, just not liking Mark at all. And I can really see this, like potentially becoming a thing or throughout the season like a bit of a theme these just throwing uh hammer blows at each other and could they come together again at another point in the season i think they definitely could because i don't think they're going to take a backward step to mark and we know mark doesn't take a backward step to anyone yeah excited <laughs> a bit of a rivalry on our hands here which would be cool that would be cool a bit of old school elbows out mark points being left on the table from him and peko big time so it's 41 points between no it's 43 points between martin and peko now a nice little handy full race weekend of points and then some ahead so like i said it's just it's up to martin now to be the peko kind of thing where it's like you're in the ascendancy it's yours to lose in a way we know you're quicker as quick as the factory boys so can you just keep that consistently going minimize any loss of points and make him catch you rather than you go back to him which what peko kind of lets people he peko goes back the other way he, he's in a position where he should just ride off home into the sunset but 
he sort of lets guys come back to him by making weird mistakes. Martin can eliminate that. Definitely, definitely favourite from here because I know it's early, but you've given him the buffer and he looks rapid. It's just whether or not he can, you know, we know Pecco is a big Sunday guy. This weekend may just be a one-off where he's the opposite. And he, of course, made that mistake in the sprint. So he left points on the table there as well. Like a weird weekend for Pecco. But if we look at the other guys who did well, I was going to say on the podium, but he didn't end up on the podium was Vinales. Obviously had the sprint win. Fantastic. Not three-time winner or a winner on three different manufacturers. You can shut the hell up. I don't know who's spouting this nonsense, but yeah, he won a race on a third different manufacturer. I'm sure there's a rider out there before who's won two Grand Prix on two different uh, manufacturer bikes and then was leading at the 12-lap mark of another Grand Prix. Yeah, that's what this is, right? You were leading halfway through another race, right? That's a half race. It's a sprint. It's not an actual Grand Prix. You've not won three Grand Prix on three different bikes. That's not how it works. It's still in play. The three for three three thing yeah um I, i'd like to get free for free that's for starters just so i get that off my chest but he was excellent and i did not expect this from him because vinyala is a bit wishy-washy for me like i still expect that with the way vinyala's is i'm still expecting him to come back at the next race and just be running around in ninth credit where it's due was exceptional this week and it was very very unlucky with the issue, technical issue he's had in the end there to cost him second place i will say i'll give him benefit of the doubt i do think best year was coming towards him but that would have been a scrap on the last lap and i he may have come out on top of it so let's say it's cost him second nasty little fall as well nice little bump in the end as well especially when he wasn't well surprised he didn't shit himself as he hit the ground there with with the issue he had <laughs> Uh, it was a it was a nasty little bump, but it did throw him off. That really good weekend from they'll take all the positives from that. I probably probably deserve more from the weekend. Bastianini, very good. This steady build. I always enjoy this when riders are just like, look, I'm not there yet, but it's building. And it is building for Bestia. I can see him being a factor in this title chase now. Because not good but not bad in Qatar with a couple of fifth places I think he ended up with here. Not great in the sprint again, finished behind Jack in in he was in sixth place, but really did a bit of a peco in terms of being good on the Sunday, just seeing what happened on Saturday, then coming back on Sunday and being strong. Like I said, it was a chance to come second anyway because uh, I thought he was coming back towards Vinales. Yeah, I mean, to finish within a second of Martin, I think if that's the performance you're giving every week, that'll be good enough to win a few races and it certainly is good enough to have you in the title race. And we've got to talk about our last man on the podium, Pedro. The second coming, of course, has arrived. And I don't know about everyone else, but we got to a point in that race where he was just doing the same as what he did in Qatar. And so I'm just sitting there going, you know, when's the drop-off coming? Like, when does it end? Where, at what point does he just start sinking back through the field at a rate of knots? And it just never happened. He just kept going. He just kept sliding that thing around, throwing it in places it shouldn't have been, and just really fucking annoying everyone. <laughs> and just going for it. And it just kept going. He never slowed down at any point. It was crazy. He is going to have ups and downs with the way he's riding and it being his first season. He's going to get to circuits that maybe do bite him a bit more like Qatar did. I don't know if maybe it's just the fact that here is the kind of circuit is maybe not as abrasive on the tires so it held out for him um, and we will obviously go to more places that maybe it doesn't work out for him quite as much pedro has kind of made there a race that i mean i thought it was an entertaining race and then when i thought back about it it's literally just him <laughs> everyone else was pretty line of stern obviously you get your action at the start there was a bit of drama at the end not involving him what well, kind of involved him because it promoted him to the podium but drama at the end, but all through the middle of the race, not much else happened except for Pedro just cutting shapes on that thing and just being a madman. So really did liven up the race. And I mean, people will be they're hearing it on commentary a lot. It's just a breath of fresh air just to have him in there. A real character, not not just off the bike, but it really shows in the way he rides. Like it comes through. It's not just like he rides like everyone else and then he gets off the bike and he's a bit of a character. Just it is him in every way. So, you know, and to finish top KTM, in his second outing when by the way the guys you're beating you know brad binder second in the world championship at the moment so if you can keep this up i tell you why oh man but you know onto the ktm boys anyway binder decent weekend obviously had the crash in the sprint which felt weird because it was his second crash of the weekend we just know he's a consistent guy he doesn't do that a lot that was a bit of a surprise and then he and jack ended up having a good sunday despite it looking a bit mediocre with what happened in front of them. So KTM bikes have ended up three, four, and five. Miller good to just 
like steady the ship here just settle down a couple of fifth places get yourself on the board and get the wheels rolling so they'll all be encouraged by that they've picked up points that they shouldn't really have got they were just a little bit off at this weekend not massively but just enough to be like we were probably good enough for seventh eighth ninth and we've ended up third fourth fifth you know kind of that kind of thing so you know they've recovered something in the end and considering binder's pace in qatar they'll be a bit surprised they were a bit off at this weekend but i do think they generally are there and binder is in it and pedro is going to be able to do this i don't think he'll be able to do it every race like this every race but every now and then i think he's going to do this pedro and he's really going to shake it up at the front so very good. Again, a lot of people you can talk about, but I, I won't go into a lot of detail on a lot of them. But, you know, another one that had similar to the KTMs was Bez, where a pretty mediocre weekend has turned into a decent one because he ended up sixth. You know, spared his blushes a little bit there. And then Frankie Morbidelli, once again, inclined to give him a pass this week. And then after next week, we're going to start going hard on uh, Frankie because we actually going to need to start seeing something there. I would a bit like to have seen him just not crash early in that race so we actually got to see over race distance could he figure something out and start to make his way through the field a little bit and obviously with all the drama that happened he could have found himself in a decent position uh obviously that wasn't to be as he went uh off-roading a little bit but yeah from the next race onwards we're gonna start really looking at frankie let's talk about the japanese bikes fabio's ended up seventh there in what is a very good performance to really this weekend really stood out that Yamaha, despite the disadvantage of having only having two bikes out there with Honda having four, look like they are still ahead of Honda. And there's something I was saying last season, you know, there was talk about, you know, Rins going to Yamaha, a few people a bit, you know, or, you know, a bit of a backward step maybe to go from the Honda to the Yamaha with Honda having more bikes on the grid, maybe a bit more power to improve and stuff like that. But it never, ever feels to me like Yamaha's struggling as badly as Honda. It might just be because their riders are better. It might just be because Fabio pulls things out and gets results he shouldn't get, and it makes them look a bit better. With Rins, I think they've got another rider capable of doing that. Rins has dropped away a little bit towards the latter stage of the race here. He's ended up behind Mir in 13th, but he was there or thereabouts at some points during the race. Mir now is starting to look a little bit like the rider that the Honda thought they were getting, where he's flying the flag for Honda now. He's getting a bit more out of it than it looks like the others are you know a guy that's a world champion a former world champion you need to start seeing this from him and you know you've got to be top honda now you've got to stay as top honda if you're if you're joan mir good by him I say, again he's ended, ended up 12th so if we look at the japan cup here now i've decided we are going to do this japan cup with old f1s like 90s points that the, the six places get the you know 10 points for first and all that we'll chuck the standings up on the screen here for you another 10 pointer for fabio in the all japan cup he's got a race home in this one so what we went fabio then mir then rins then come with the moment come with the man takanakagami ahead of yoan zarko his teammate and then once again luke marini way way off it he's finished behind mark who obviously had, had his crash now i say way off it he's Two second, two and a half seconds behind Zarko across the line. But what's concerning is he just doesn't seem to be able to click with this thing at all. And look, obviously, the first, everybody's going to start saying, that, oh, well, you know, he'll be regretting leaving Ducati and all that. Well, results wise, yeah, obviously. And the fact that he's struggling to get to grips, grips with it this much obviously will make him start to feel a little bit like, oh, fuck, you know, what have I done? But I still think this was worth the risk to go to the factory Honda. There's still every chance, like, this year's poor, next year they might be good. Like, can you be on board the ship when it really sets sail? I still think it was worth the risk. What was his other option? Just, I mean, I know he's the odd podium here and there and he's on a more competitive bike, but at Ducati, just running around as, like, the, what, sixth, seventh, eighth best Ducati? Like, you're still not going to win a world championship doing that anyway. So I still think this offers him a good opportunity. Uh, if... He can start to figure it out a little bit, but it is a little bit worrying. I mean, if we look at qualifying, and this really told a story, qualifying genuinely told a story for Honda this week. Whereas both Yamahas went into Q2, Honda occupied the last four places on the grid. And again, Marini four tenths slower than Taka over a lap in qualifying. I don't know if he made a mistake or anything. I didn't see qualifying this week, but my goodness. Anyway, that wraps up MotoGP for us. We've chatted about it for ages. Uh, let's talk Moto2. And it's finally happened. Aaron Canet is a Moto2 Grand Prix winner. Congratulations, Aaron. The last week I said that Canet cannot. Canet can... Net? 
So very good. Uh, and he was impressive because he found himself buried a little bit on the opening laps and then just fucking dropped the hammer, didn't he? And he, he was away. Really well done. Uh, obviously helped a little bit with Fermin Aldeguer getting his double long that penalty for the jump start. Alonso Lopez, uh, who looked like the only guy at that point that was probably going to challenge. And I thought it would have been a tight finish between the two. Lopez may have even edged him with the pace he was going at. But yeah, he's had a crash and uh, he's blown it. So Canet was there to pick up the pieces. And the amount of times Canet's come second in this kind of situation where the guy in front of him was just a bit quick for him and finished like a second up the road. How has this never happened before? Where the guy in the lead, because that happens every now and then, the guy in the lead just crashes and blows it and then Canet's there to pick up the pieces. It's just never happened for him, but now it has. After round one, Moto2 was the class that looked least like what I thought it was going to end up looking like by the end of the season. The kind of, like the riders that were at the front compared to the ones who struggled and stuff like that with Aldeguer struggling and, and all that sort of stuff. Canet as well. This is now looking a lot more status quo. This is where I expected guys to be. I mean, other than the fact that Aldeguer and Lopez stuffed up, the order was generally where I expected it to be. The only one that's still struggling a little bit, I've got Tony Arbolino, who, I don't know what happened, he was running about 7th, I think, with about 5 laps to go, and then I blinked and he was 12th. Don't know if maybe his tyres went off a cliff in those last 5 laps right at the end of the race, and I think it was a bit of a group that caught him, so once one caught him, they all caught him, and he dropped 5 places in 5 laps to end up 12th. Poor result in the end. Barry Baltus couldn't back it up. He's finished 10 seconds off the lead in 13th. But generally, I think everyone is where they should be. And all this doubt over Fermin Aldeguer signing that contract early and have the Ducati maybe made a mistake. Is he not going to turn up this season? Yeah, he's turning up. Don't worry about him. He is turning up. I feel like he's probably winning that race if he doesn't get the double long lap. He's finished three seconds off the lead and he's done two long lap penalties. So I think this year, the main battle is the speed up boys. I think it's Lopez and Aldeguer look better than everyone else. I think Canet's there or thereabouts. Good to see Joe Roberts and Manu Gonzalez there. I don't know if they'll be able to do it all season. And then I think your next challenger that Ayagura, Sergio Garcia. And then it's just whether or not Tony Arbolino can figure it out, but it's not looking like it at the moment. But I think, yeah, it's the speed up boys. And then the next batch of challenges is Canet and then the MT Helmets lads, Ayagur and Sergio Garcia. And then I think Joe Roberts and guys like that will just grab your podium here and there. I don't know if they'll be able to win races. The only factor we haven't seen is Jake Dixon. So whether he comes in and can mix it with them, we don't know yet. I suspect he's going to be more in that Joe Roberts Gonzalez camp where they are just occasional podium contenders and generally around that sort of top fourth to 10th, I suppose. But we haven't seen him, so we don't know. In Moto3, obviously a good race again. A bit to talk about here, because we ended up with a little duel at the end, Olgaard over Wader, with a tiny little breakaway at the end. I don't think Ortola was quick enough to be on the podium this week, and he's ended up on the podium. I think he just was quick enough to be in the league group, but there were guys there with way more pace than him, and we'll talk about him in a second. But yeah, Holgado, very good to win the race. Rueda, I think, probably was the quickest guy out there. Could have, maybe should have won the race, but good racecraft from Olgado to get it done in the end. Like I said, Altola third. But let's talk about the two guys that I think were the other two quickest guys on the day. David Alonso always is there thereabouts. Whether he's the quickest guy on the day or not, he's always a factor. And Joel Kelso. Now, Joel Kelso's ended up fifth here. Now, Alonso looked like he lost pace in the end. Maybe his tyres went in the last couple of laps, so uh, maybe he wasn't the quick, one of the quickest guys on the day, but he's just always there or thereabouts, so you think that maybe he could be a factor. Joel Kelso, being Australian, when I watch these races, I'm just like watching Joel Kelso. Like, I just want him to do well. I'm supporting Joel Kelso. I, I'm a Joel Kelso fan. When I watch these races, that's who I want to win every race. And obviously, in the future, Jacob Ralston as well. But my God, if he, this guy, this kid doesn't frustrate the shit out of me. Because he and Rueda, if you just gave every single one of these Moto3 riders some clear track that weekend and just said, go for it. These are the two quickest guys on the weekend, Rueda and Kelso. That is it. Over a lap, clear track in front of them. These two are the two quickest guys around that circuit this week. Now, Rueda used that speed and potential to be challenging for the win across the line. Didn't get it, unlucky, but you're there or thereabouts. Joel Kelso has left a lot on the table here. He's ended up fifth after, look, once you get into this little scrap at the end and Olgada and Wada and, and Ortola break away from you, you can do no better than fourth. And he's ended up fifth. So in that sense, yeah, well, that's fine. And actually, for the first time ever, I've heard it, because this is something I've been going on about, Joel Kelso sitting there with all the pace in the world and the kid just doesn't make overtakes. It's the first time I've heard it mentioned other than me thinking it. Uh, on commentary, uh, Gavin Emmett mentioned it and he, and, and he made the point a couple of times. So obviously the, people are noticing it that aren't just the people watching Joel like me. You know, I think he mentioned something about eat or be eaten kind of thing. And it's, it's so true. If you're not willing to put the overtakes in, 
someone will do it to you. And so even though you are quick enough to be top two that day, you've ended up fifth. At the end of the race, he did start to make a couple of moves and got himself into that sort of fourth, I think it was, maybe third, before he got shuffled again. Where it's different is Olgado, Rueda, Ortola, Alonso, and Alonso dropped away at the end like we mentioned, they made sure that every time they got past, they went back past someone because then you stay in the top three or four and you don't get shuffled back. And then when the split does happen, you give yourself a good chance of being in the front and then you can win the race. Joel seems resigned to the fact that he's not going to make a move and then guys make moves on him. He ended up back in like eighth or so. He ended up behind Via and stuff at one point. You know, the amount of laps it took him to get past Ricardo Rossi, just like, just do it. Like, I know it's not, it's easy for me to say sit here. And I'm not saying it as in like I would do it. I'm saying it as in like everyone else does it. So you've got to do it. Phenomenally quick. Joel Kelso was around that circuit that weekend. So he's got to have been quick enough to be able to show a wheel here or there. And he didn't do it till too late. And I think you watch guys like Olgado is an expert at it. Alonso as well. But Olgado, because he likes to be at the front. Even when like, Olgado wasn't as quick as Rueda this week. There's no way Olgado was as quick over that lap as Rueda. But because he just kept scrapping with him, it keeps him with you. And then there was even points where they was threatening to break away Olgado because he got himself to the front. And that's where, I mean, not just, Joel, I'm sure there's other guys in the field. If you're watching other guys as closely as that, they're probably doing similar things. I don't know if the people watching, I don't know what, don't pay much attention to Scott Ogden, but maybe the British fans watch Ogden and see the same thing. I don't know. But I see it a lot with Joel because I'm just constantly watching him and watching his position on track and seeing what he's doing. And just the amount of times he showed, like he pulled in a little bit. You're like, oh, it's a big gap there. They've, they've showed, they've, he's offered it to you. Rossi's just offered you the inside there and then you tuck back in and just follow him around. And the next corner, Someone just comes past Joel and he goes back another position. Look, it was a good race, other than me getting frustrated with Joel's finishing position. And you know what? Great result for him, but there was so much on offer for him this weekend. Uh, Colin Vaya, sixth, who's a favourite of mine as well. Good results for Esteban, the young uh, young Spaniard. Another good result for Jacob Ralston in 11th. That's pretty much it. Not much else to say, really. For Asato, back to uh, type. It's finished 18th after an exceptional Qatar round. Generally, your contenders are there. David Alonso fell away at the end, but that's it. And that is it for another week of MotoGP. Long break now. We've got the three-week break. I think it is now till Kota. I'll try and get some videos out in the meantime, but otherwise enjoy your break. We don't like having the break, but we've lost Argentina, haven't we? So I think that would have been in between if I remember correctly. So that's why there is a bit of a mid-season break at the start of the season. We'll see you on the next one. Goodbye.